In every generation, pastors face the same temptation to try to draw a crowd through entertainment or novelty at the expense of solid, straightforward Bible teaching. Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg encourages pastors to stay focused on God's Word and to depend on the Holy Spirit rather than human ingenuity. Alistair is teaching from the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians. With God, all things are possible. By my God, I can run through a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Therefore, we will ask God to show himself strong in our generation through the stumbling, bumbling attempts of the likes of us to fulfill the promises of his word in relationship to the teaching and preaching of the Bible. Now, what I want to do in the balance of my time is to take from John Owen five statements that he made concerning this. He says, if we are going then to be effective in the teaching and preaching of the Bible, we need ourselves spiritual wisdom and understanding of the mysteries of the gospel. Secondly, he said it was imperative that there was the experience of the power of truth in our own souls. You see these words? He's not talking here about the ability for us to process information in our minds and so having grasped enough intellectually to communicate from our heads to the heads of other people. We are not giving lectures. This is not a monologue. This is a dialogue. And the dialogue is actually between the Spirit of God and the heart of man via the strange mechanism of the human larynx and tongue. And that in itself is a great mystery. When you read the prophets in the King James Version, I think something of this grips us, doesn't it? In the NIV or in a modern translation, it says, uh, the oracle of God, you know, to Malachi. When you go to the King James Version, it says, the burden of, the burden of God to Malachi. You see, now he is experiencing the truth in his own soul. I'm not sure I know much about this. But I do know that Owen is right. If it doesn't dwell in power in us, it will not pass in power from us. There's a reason why we can't preach powerfully. There is a reason why we can hear ourselves speak, which is the worst of all sermon. When we can audit our own homiletical performance as we're going along. Thirdly, he said, if we're going to effectively be involved in doing this, there needs to be spiritual wisdom and understanding of the mysteries of the gospel and the experience of the power of the truth in our own lives. And thirdly, a skill in dividing the Word of God correctly. Skill in dividing the Word of God correctly. Having said all that we've said, we now need to turn to the whole aspect of the practicality of doing what we do. And we don't, in coming to this third point, obviously set aside the two previous points or all of the emphasis that we've already given to the primacy of the Spirit and to the absolute necessity of God being at work. We recognize that all of our gifts, whatever they are, spiritual or natural, are completely useless in our communication, in and of themselves. They're totally useless. Unless, as preachers, we are in touch with God in love with our people, and on fire with the truth. At that point, what God has equipped us with naturally and spiritually may then come to a position of usefulness. Until then, we may be like uh, somebody standing on on a railway platform calling out train times with crowds walking past. Every so often, someone paying attention, but by and large, people saying, I don't know why that fellow's standing there. Why is he doing that? Why is he standing out there doing that? I don't understand a jolly word he's had to say. And I've been coming here for seven weeks. If my mother put food on the plate the way he puts truth on my plate that I'm supposed to eat, I I may as well 
forget a knife and fork and just bury my face in it and suck on it in the hope that it may find its way to some position of usefulness. But in terms of going at it appropriately, there would be no reason to because all I get are big slabs of information, great chunks of truth, great things that apparently matter to him, but it for sure doesn't matter a hill of beans to me, and I'm not sure I understand why he's so concerned about it at all. The average sermon is like a guy with a small automatic pistol firing all over the jolly place. He's a danger to be around. If anything happens to hit you, it's a miracle, and hopefully it will not be fatal. There's a reason why people say preaching does no good, because a lot of it does no good. There's a reason why people say people will not listen to preaching, because they shouldn't listen to the jolly preaching. It's so bad. It's so clumsy. It's so artless. It's so unformed. It's so downright, patently, the fullness of laziness. You go in a carpenter's workbench, he uses wood. He tells you, I've got this piece of wood in such and such a place. And if you'll notice, I'm going to use the back of it for a cello. It has beautiful grain. It, it is wonderful. You'll see how it takes, for example, uh, the, 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 the plane when I put it on. Look at how it does, and he waxes his eloquent on it. The individual takes the cello and says, this is the medium that I use in order to communicate this. And they take the cello and they play it, and it produces all this wonderful news, noise. What is the medium for the preacher? Words. Words. Are you good with words? What do you think your vocabulary is? How many words do you think are in your vocabulary? Do you think there are more words in your vocabulary in the last 10 years as a result of your ability to read and process information than were present in your vocabulary when you finished high school? We need to take care with words. Can I encourage you about this? I bought a little dictionary the other day in the airport just so I could keep it with me. I'm so into dictionaries in the moment. And I, and I flew home from Los Angeles. My wife said, I never spoke to her hardly at all. I was wearing those Bose earphones which allows you to ignore everybody around you. And, um, it's, which is not a good thing, but it's an honest uh, acknowledgement on my part. So I had the earphones on and a, little, and a little Webster's dictionary. And she said somewhat cheekily when we got off the plane, when we were starting to get our bags, she said, well, did you enjoy reading your dictionary? I said, yeah, as it happens. Yeah. But I only read, you know, I, but, I, but I was going through definition after definition after definition. I didn't know hardly five words on a page. And words are my craft. You know, I haven't analyzed this at all, and I don't even know, but I, I use the same words all the jolly time. <laughs> I've used jolly at least five times. <laughs> You've got to come up with another adjective than that. That's hopeless. <laughs> and the practicality of it, I, wonder, I want to say to you again, and you must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but I really think the key to your ability to verbalize effectively, especially if you go off extemporaneously on a tangent, your ability to do that well will be as a result of your willingness to write things down in the process of uh, your preparation. And, you know, it's not going to do to jot down a few headings and then trust to the inspiration of the moment. Because you don't have a good enough vocabulary to go and grab information. Neither do I. You know, I don't have a broad enough grasp of the English language to be able to pull down the right word in the moment. So I'm going to have to do the hard work of finding the right word in the darkness of the evening hour so that in the light of the morning hour I may be able to employ that word. The computer programs now are fantastic for a golf swing. I'm sure you've all seen them. If you've gone to a golf pro, uh, what he does is he videotapes you and then he takes you into his, his little um, uh, studio and he says, now what I want to do is I want to show you your swing, but I want to give you the opportunity to have your swing compared with uh, any golfer from this vast array. And so if you decide you can have uh, Freddie Couples who is brought up on the screen beside you and then he sets... He sets the swing plane up of Freddie Couples, and then he superimposes you on Freddie Couples, and he shows you your swing plane. 
Yes, he does. <laughs> and you might think you were doing good till you got yourself up against the swing plane of Freddy or the swing plane of Tiger or whoever you want to be up against. Now, I know that we're not supposed to compare ourselves. We're not supposed to do these things. But find somebody that at least approximates to the way you want to teach and preach the Bible. And then copy them. Copy them. I don't mean copy their intonations. I don't mean copy their funny mannerisms or try and be them. But copy them in the way that you would copy the swing plane of somebody else. Because there are certain rudimentary elements in what is happening in simply taking the club away online and bringing it back online, that if somebody, as you visualize them, helps you to do that, then go ahead and do it. And if it helps you to have that person in mind as you're doing that, then go on. Fourthly, there needs to be spiritual discernment concerning the condition of our congregation. If we're going to be effective in preaching and teaching, uh, there needs to be spiritual discernment of the condition of our congregation. Eric Alexander last year said, we have to preach to the congregation we have, not the congregation we wish we had. All right? So you just have finished uh, your studies, you just did a deem in, and uh, now you think you're an intellectual. Your wife knows you're still an intellectual pygmy, but uh, you've decided that you're now going to give them the, the, the great benefits of whatever you, just, whatever you just discovered. Frankly, you hadn't much of a clue what you were doing yourself, but it hasn't stopped you from launching into this series which is absolutely dreadful and bears no uh, correlation to where your congregation is. Now, how do we ever know where our congregation is unless we're with our congregation, unless we have a sense of where they are, however that comes? Whether it comes flooding at us with emails, whether it comes as a result of meeting people in the grocery store, whether it comes as a result of sitting with them in their bereavement and in their disappointments, whether it comes in talking with children as we happen just to meet them in the corridor, whether it comes as a result of sitting down with a, for a moment or two with a little girl that drew us one of those dreadful pictures of ourselves preaching and so on that we take up and stick on our wall and thank God that she was there. Whatever it is, somehow or another we have to get that because people are our books. People are our books. And that is not to say that it is a kind of consumer-led approach to our uh, teaching series, but it sure matters that we understand those to whom we speak. That's why I read, incidentally, from 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, you know how we were with you. We were like a mom. We were like a mother with you, as a mother is gentle with her children. The mother gets down where her children are. A mother gives herself to her children. The whole of our life is essentially given over to accommodating herself to her children so that she might provide for them in a way that they are able to absorb. That's what we're supposed to do as well. And as a father, he says, uh, we did what a father should do. That is, we gave you moral guidance and we gave you a framework. We were exhorting you and encouraging you and so on. And a father knows the needs of his children. A father delights to give good gifts to his children. And a father makes and keeps his promises. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole, well, we've got to understand uh, the philosophical milieu in which we're ministering. It's kind of boring now, all this postmodern stuff. Let's just say this. Postmodernism, deconstructionism, taken, taken to its logical conclusion, is absolute stupidity. Nothing means nothing, and everything means everything, and everything, and blah, 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 right? It's just absolute nonsense. You know, the lecturer who's teaching deconstructionism uh, tells his class and this and so on and everything else and the boy puts up his hand and says I'm really disappointed with you uh, speaking as you've just done uh, in such a way concerning the Aborigines in Australia oh the teacher said I didn't say a thing about the Aborigines in Australia oh said the student well that's what it sounded like to me Words work, despite the philosophical, idiotic ramblings in the ivory towers. Words work, and God's words work best. We have in the Word of God objective, verifiable truth. And if you lose conviction concerning that, 
then you and I have lost our ability to convey the truth with effectiveness. And the flip side of the postmodern question, of course, is the fact that men and women now, in terms of trying to understand uh, things not simply on a cerebral level, but they want to process them emotionally and everything else, fine, acknowledge that in your congregation. Recognize that that's the truth. And so in the use of narrative and in the explication of the parables, it's not illegitimate to ask in teaching the material and made sure that we have the, the, the melodic line and made sure that we have the theological principle. It, it's not wrong at all to say, I, I, can you imagine how the woman felt in going into that hostile crowd and unloosening her hair and using it to wipe the feet of Christ? It's not illegitimate to do as we were bid last night, to say to them, isn't it amazing how God only had eyes for Naomi? And do you ever feel that God perhaps has missed you? That God knows your name? They appeal to them on the level of feeling. Not as a result of the absence of, of intellect, but on the, on the basis of it, if you like. Last point. Zeal for the glory of God and a compassion for the souls of men. We we'll never preach effectively without a zeal for the glory of God and a compassion for the souls of men. You know, this story is so well worn, isn't it? Henry Martin goes to Persia. He sees a picture of Christ bowing down before Muhammad. And he writes in his journal, I could not endure this. It would be hell to me to see Jesus always thus dishonored. Post 9-11, Christ has been dishonored from the strangest of sources because we equivocate on the absolute exclusive claims of Jesus of Nazareth as the only name under heaven given among men by which they must be saved. And only a zeal for God's glory and a genuine compassion to see people come to Christ will allow us then to work our way systematically and consecutively through the Scriptures, recognizing that when we preach the Bible, if we do so uh, properly, we, we are almost inevitably all the time preaching the gospel. Because it's all about the wonder of Jesus and his redeeming love. It's all about redemption. James S. Stewart, whose books you should find in the used section and fight over them and, and grab them for yourself and take them away if there are any there, in his little book, Heralds of God talking about this zeal for glory and compassion for the souls of men, he puts it in this way, redemptive work is always costly. There is no hope of ease for the faithful servant of the cross. It is involved in the very nature of his task that he can never be at the end of it. Not his to evade the burden and the heat of the day. Physical weariness, sickness of heart, and bitter disappointment, the strain of the passion for souls, all the wear and tear of vicarious burden-bearing, these he will know in full measure. He may even find himself wondering sometimes why he ever accepted a commission in a warfare in which there is no discharge. He may have moods when a haunting sense of anticlimax overwhelms him. It's one thing to set out gallantly when the flags are waving and the drums summoning to a new crusade, but it's quite another thing to keep plodding on when the road is difficult and the initial impetus has spent its force and the trumpets of the dawn have ceased to blow. It's one thing to have inspirations. It's another to have tenacity. My little children, wrote Paul to the Galatians, of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. A swift and startling turn of phrase, giving a profoundly moving insight into the price of true Christian ambassadorship. <laughs> Incidentally, is this craft in the use of language? He was not a natural at this. He learned this. For it is by no breath, turn of eye, wave of hand, that salvation joins issue with death. And if ever a man finds the work of the ministry becoming easily manageable and surmountable, an undemanding vocation, without strain or any encumbering load of care, he is to be pitied 
not congratulated. For he has so flagrantly lost touch with one whose ministry of reconciliation could be accomplished and fulfilled only through Gethsemane and Calvary. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins unless something of the pastor's life blood goes into his quest for souls and into the word he brings them from the Lord. The quest remains fruitless and the word devoid of delivering power. I hope these rambling thoughts will help us as we try and encourage one another to plod on Plod on. The other man's grass is always greener, incidentally. We all have the places we think we'd like to be. You know, if we had this, if we had that, if we had the next thing. There's no ideal place to serve God except the place He sets you down. And um, we all need to know that. essential reminder for those serving in pastoral ministry from Alistair Begg. Today's message is a part of a seven-volume series called The Pastor's Study, and if you'd like to request a copy of all seven volumes on USB, it's available for just our cost to produce without any markup. Look for the USB at truthforlife.org. Here at Truth For Life, we are passionate about supporting local congregations. That's why every October during Pastor Appreciation Month, we set aside time to focus on issues related to shepherding a congregation. Whether or not you're a church pastor, we can all benefit from being reminded of God's purpose and design for His church. To go along with this study, we're also featuring a resource that will be especially helpful for pastors, elders, and lay leaders. It's a brand new book from Alistair's colleague at Parkside Church, Jonathan Holmes. The book is titled Counsel for Couples, a Biblical and Practical Guide for Marriage Counseling. There are so many obstacles for couples pursuing God's design for marriage, and many pastors feel under-equipped for the task of guiding those in crisis. In this book, Jonathan draws from years of marriage counseling experience and offers a practical handbook for working with struggling couples. And most importantly, all of Jonathan's instruction is deeply rooted in sound theology and biblical principles. Counsel for Couples is filled with helpful references, encouraging testimonies, and biblical foundations to equip and encourage you in the field of marriage ministry. We'd love to send you a copy of the book, Counsel for Couples, when you donate today to help Truth for Life continue delivering clear, relevant Bible teaching to people all around the world. Go to truthforlife.org slash donate, or mention the book when you call 888-588-7884. By the way, even if you're not a pastor, this book is a great tool for those who provide marriage counseling in a less than official capacity as well. So if you're a small group leader or you have friends or adult children who come to you for advice, this book is an excellent guide to help you make sure you're giving them solid biblical counsel. Ask for your copy today. Call 888-588-7884. And if you'd prefer to mail your donation along with your request for the book, write to Truth For Life at P.O. Box 39 Cleveland, Ohio, 44139. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair continues the pastor's study with a look at the qualities of a great leader. You might be surprised at one trait that's at the top of the list. Be sure to listen Friday. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg, and it's furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.